Good morning. Um, thanks to everybody for being here. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, I'm Olga Olaker. I direct the Russia and Eurasia program here. And I am uh, also the person, in case of any emergency in the course of the next hour and a half, I will be providing you with some sort of uh, direction as to what to do, which might amount to following the uh, red lit exit signs, which you can see. Um, but um, I'm really very excited to welcome Dr. Kristen von Brusgard here for a conversation about Russian nuclear strategy since the Cold War. Um, Kristen is a MacArthur Nuclear Security Postdoctoral Fellow at CSAC at Stanford. Um, and she's been writing about Russian nuclear strategy and deterrence dynamics for quite some time. I'm hopeful some, if not all of you, have had the opportunity to read her work if you haven't. Uh, I suggest you seek it out. Um, she's also been a research fellow at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies and a senior <coughs> policy analyst at the Norwegian Armed Forces. Um, I'll provide some commentary after, um, after Kristen speaks. And we're really thrilled to have Michael Kaufman, um, who uh, is uh, an expert um, on uh, Russia, Eurasia, and also Pakistan, but who works primarily on Russian military issues at now at the Center for Naval Analyses. Uh, and Mike has agreed to moderate our discussion, um, which I hope will be uh, a, really, um, a really enjoyable one. And I'm also looking forward to hearing what our very knowledgeable audience has to say. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Kristen, and uh, I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you, Olya, and thank you for uh, this opportunity to uh, be here in this uh, distinguished uh, crowd and present uh, what is really a condensed version of my dissertation work. Um, so I'm going to bombard you with information for about 25 minutes. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing your reactions and comments and uh, questions. So um, I set out to uh, study Russian nuclear strategy a bit before it became so fashionable, I guess. Uh, and, but, and my goal at that point was the same essentially as it is now, to shed better light over what Russian st uh, strategy really uh, is, uh, rather than uh, buying the argument that uh, Russian strategy uh, is uh, offensive or instilled on using nuclear weapons early in a conflict. Uh, for example, to coerce innocent uh, Baltic countries into submission. So I started working on this in 2014 when these arguments were already being made. And this was a well emerging as a major concern among Western policymakers. People were talking uh, then, as they are now, about escalating to de-escalate. Uh, and this was part of the reason I started consulting uh, Russian uh, doctrines, Russian strategy, in order to try and figure out whether this was actually their uh, strategy. And back then, uh, uh, as, uh, in part uh, as it is now, I would say, the main argument that this had to be Russian strategy was the large Russian arsenal of substrategic nuclear weapons. So I started digging into uh, what uh, Russian uh, strategy and doctrine uh, was, uh, and uh, I found uh, significant variation in Russian strategy over time. I did find that at, some, at one point in time, Russian nuclear strategy had elevated the role of uh, nuclear weapons in the early 2000s when they explicitly stated that because of their conventional inferiority, they would have no choice but to resort to nuclear weapons in a potential conflict. But I also found that before this, in the early 90s, Russian nuclear strategy had a different orientation altogether and was deterrence or Oriented, and I found that by 2010 and in the period after, Russia had sought to de-emphasize the role of nuclear weapons uh, in their military strategy. So the main puzzle I sought to explain in my uh, dissertation work is why we've seen this significant variation over a period uh, in time, at least until the past four years, when Russia's security environment didn't really change as radically as uh, its nuclear strategy seemed to change. <clears throat> so, in 
So uh, the argument I'm going to make is that I believe the current uh, Western obsession with uh, Russian early and limited nuclear use is a misrepresentation of Russian nuclear strategy, which cannot be understood simply through this one theory that was promoted by a group of Russian strategists some 18 years ago. I think this misrepresentation of Russian strategy stems in part uh, from uh, too large a focus on uh, capability as the only indicator of strategy type and from a neg ne negligence of paying attention to other aspects of strategy, in particular declaratory strategy and also in part nuclear posturing. I argue that by observing patterns of all these three aspects of strategy, namely declaratory strategy, posturing and capabilities, uh, one, see, uh, one sees a pattern that suggests a uh, move toward a less offensive orientation in Russian strategy. And, and moreover, I argue that both external and internal drivers explain this move to a less offensive uh, nuclear strategy since the early 2000s. First, I make the case that Russia has used its nuclear strategy to compensate primarily for milita military inferiority, particularly for conventional inferiority. This inferiority was at a critical low in the late 1990s and early 2000s, when all aspects of Russian strategy indicated an increased emphasis on nuclear weapons and a lower threshold for nuclear weapons use. But from 2010, Russia improved its conventional and non-conventional capabilities, uh, in, uh, entailing that its reliance on nuclear weapons is uh, gradually diminishing. In other words, I made the case that there are structural explanations for a reducing Russian emphasis on nuclear options. That is not to say that nuclear weapons are not important to Russia. Nuclear deterrence remains critical to Russian security. But to claim that, Russia, uh, that Russia's nuclear weapons are a key warfighting tool of choice for Russia, I believe, is misleading and uh, misperceived. The second argument, uh, argument I make is that there are domestic uh, drivers and domestic explanations for this shift toward a less offensive uh, nuclear strategy. Russian nuclear strategy is the product of bureaucratic bickering within the Russian system and its outcome depend, depends on the interests and the preferences of the key protagonists who participate in this process. <clears throat> I demonstrate that military actors dominate strategy formulation in Russia and that their preferences have moved toward emphasizing conventional warfighting options over nuclear warfighting options. So this is the second explanation I find for why Russian strategy has in fact come less rather than more offensive in recent years, despite the deterioration in political relations between Russia and its main nuclear competitor, the United States. Milit Russian military actors seem to be more preoccupied with relevant tools for winning the next war and and they still express concern that nuclear weapons may not be the ideal uh, war fighting tool or war winning tool. So I'm going to talk about uh, four cases of Russian nuclear strategy that I've studied uh, in my work, uh, each of which, which starts from the publication of a military doctrine, uh, and then, but then I also study um, both capability developments and posturing in the same periods. So the first uh, case that I study is uh, the fir very first Russian military doctrine issued by President Yeltsin, which he issued in a period of significant uh, upheaval and chaos, both politically, economically, and militarily. So, and the nuclear issues of the day in this period was not necessarily, uh, or at least not exclusively, how to strategize for a new era. It was also how to deal with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the fact that Soviet strategic forces were spread across four former republics. In this context, Yeltsin issued a new military doctrine with relatively defensive nuclear content, portraying a deterrent role for nuclear weapons and even outlawing the limited use of nuclear weapons as abhorrent. 
nuclear capabilities were in this period being drawn down significantly as a result of bilateral agreements between the United States and the Soviet Union and later <laughs> Russia, but also because of resource shortages. And this also significantly imp impacted posturing and nuclear operations in this period. This deterrence-oriented strategy can then be explained as a result of the improved relations with the United States, the, re the reduced level of threat, etc. And it can be explained also as a result of, uh, of the balance of power as nuclear parity remained in this period, even if every other indicator of power, um, uh, according to every other indicator of power, Russia had fallen far behind the United States. So, for example, when we look at the conventional balance of power in this period, there is a, there is a stark contrast between Russia and the United States, uh, as displayed by the conduct of Russian operations in Chechnya versus the conduct of American operations in Iraq. When we study the 1993 doctrine in more detail, we see the repercussions of this through, for example, the revocation of the Soviet No First Use Clause. So there is a certain impact of the concerns triggered uh, by the changed balance of power and by uh, a consideration uh, of how important nuclear weapons would be for Russia in this new security environment. This was, uh, I argue, the result of military influence of strategy, which is evident in these uh, elements of um, um, more uh, offensive strategy content, despite Yeltsin's efforts to strictly control uh, defense policy in this period, centralizing power under his own uh, remit and limiting the impact of all other uh, agencies on defense policy. Uh, there were some remnants of uh, Soviet uh, civilian control over strategic policy that remained into the early 1990s, which ensured a civilian impact on, this, uh, on strategy in the early 1990s. But still, the military were able to dictate some critical decisions, such as the revocation of the No First Use Clause. So there is some, uh, there, there are some uh, significant elements of military influence on nuclear strategy in this period, despite the fact that the Russian military was in great disarray in this period. So the, this indicates sort of uh, the structural influence of the Russian military on nuclear strategy. And an early sign of the military influence, that, uh, a military influence that would grow in the periods uh, that would come after. The second case I study is then uh, the second military doctrine issued by Russia in 2000 when uh, Putin uh, has uh, just been um, instituted or and, and later elected as president. By this time, uh, the conditions that I just described in terms of both externalities and uh, internalities had significantly changed. Putin publishes the second military doctrine with uh, quite offensive nuclear language, lowering the bar for nuclear weapons use, where the previous doctrine, in fact, hadn't said anything about the, u the actual use of nuclear weapons uh, beyond ruling out their limited use. By now, uh, capability developments uh, were falling starkly behind, in part because of uh, economic constraints as well. So what explains this stark shift from the early 90s to the late 90s? First, the external environment. Russia became significantly more concerned with their own conventional capability lag, in particular when observing NATO's Kosovo intervention in 99. The scenario that they could only foresee in their wildest nightmares in the early 1990s suddenly hit much closer to home for Russian military planners. This may seem surprising to us, but Russian military and civilian theorists at the time were contemplating a similar type intervention in Russia as a result of Russian warfare in Chechnya. And Russia had no good options for dealing with a large-scale conventional air campaign of the type that NATO displayed in Kosovo. So the solution to this strategic uh, impasse for Russia was nuclear balancing, through substantial plans for nuclear refurbishment, through changing declaratory strategy, and through uh, posturing in the 1999 Zapad exercise. At the time, Defense Minister Sergeyev said, 
Uh, this exercise, that is Zapad 1999, rehearses one provision of Russian military doctrine, the use of nuclear force when all measures of conventional defense against aggression have failed. So this was a direct response to conventional inferiority uh, and, um, and also a direct response to what was seen as an emerging nuclear inferiority if key investment decisions uh, to, for example, sustain the entire strategic triad were not made. There were also decisions made to sustain and modernize sub-strategic options such as the dual-use air-launched cruise missile. Domestically, the political conditions in this period were much more settled than in the 1990s, but civilian control over nuclear strategy had not improved. The 2000 case demonstrates the consequences of the super-presidential system that Yeltsin had instituted, whereby he had limited uh, any other uh, agency's ability to influence nuclear strategy decisions. He had been so keen on depriving other authorities' power over military matters that he rid both the parliament and the defense ministry really with any substantial tools for controlling the military. Uh, <clears throat> so even if a civilian institution, the Security Council, which sorted directly under the, the president, was in charge of strategy formulation, its deliberations were based uh, exclusively almost on military drafts. There were uh, or at least I found very little evidence of any separate sources of strategic know-how in this period. And the political leadership seemed to become enamored with these military ideas of lowering the nuclear threshold as the solution to the strategic problem. More, and part of the reason they became enamored with the solution was probably that this was more cost efficient than the other solution that military uh, lobbyists promoted, such as General Staff Chief Kwashnin, who uh, lobbied hard for conventional modernization rather than nuclear modernization. So now at least the nuclear prone military camp, in part aided by arms industrialists, had it, but this would not last for that long. Because by 2010, uh, yet another Russian president, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, issues a third military doctrine, this time resigning from the so-called lowered nuclear threshold that we saw exhibited in 2000. He introduces a new formulation for when Russia may use nuclear weapons, when the very existence of the state is under threat. Certainly a higher bar for nuclear weapons used than what we saw around the millen millennial uh, shifts uh, and a formulation that seems much more closely knit to uh, concrete threats or aggression against Russian territory. Why do we see this shift? The obvious explanation uh, from a systemic point of view is a reduced need by now for balancing conventional inferiority. At this point, military modernization is already underway with significant plans for both conventional and nuclear refurbishment. Resource constraints seem no longer to be a problem, so now there is a possibility of balancing uh, against strategic problems with, um, and balancing conventional inferiority with conventional capability, which was not seen as an option in the early 2000s. There is also the option of more resounding nuclear capability balancing. That raises the question of whether capability balancing in the conventional and nuclear domain reduces the need for declaratory balancing. There, there is a possibility that it does. At least there didn't seem to be a need for this active compensatory declaratory balancing that we saw in the previous case. There is also uh, significant uh, ba Russian balancing in terms of posturing as they res started resuming, for example, strategic flight patterns in this uh, period. <clears throat> but there are also domestic currents that are driving this reduced emphasis on nuclear weapons. First and foremost, there is evidence of increased civilian control over military policy in this period. By this time, Russia's had two civilian defense ministers, uh, both of which at least attempted to instill uh, greater civilian control over military policy. 
the impact of, uh, of, of their ability to do so on nuclear strategy content is quite difficult to uh, discern. But there is one interesting issue in the 2010 uh, nuclear strategy, which is uh, the disappearance of the so-called preemptive clause that was announced by the Security Council leadership in advance of strategy or of doctrine publication. The Security Council uh, secretary and his deputy both said that the new doctrine will contain a uh, clause for nuclear preemption. And by the time the doctrine was published, this clause was not there. Uh, there, they announced a publication of a classified version of the doctrine and a lot of analysts were, were claiming at the time that, uh, to be sure, the preemptive clause has moved into the classified version even though it's not in the open version. I would posit that it, that it seems counterproductive to have two versions of the same doctrine that directly contradict each other. Um, and there are uh, several high-ranking former Russian military officials uh, who, have cl who have claimed in the aftermath o also that uh, preemption was not part of the classified doctrine either. Rather, it was um, removed, uh, and I quote, as a part of the politicization of uh, the military doctrine, which is a euphemism, I believe, for the possibility that uh, President Medvedev might, might have removed it himself. At least that was the only final point of change after the Security Council had, had finished with their version of the doctrine. So this may be one example of a significant civilian impact on nuclear strategy. But still, the revocation of this uh, preemptive clause and the move toward a greater emphasis on uh, conventional uh, deterrence was not entirely con uh, contrary to military interests as they, as they were expressed at the time. Several military theorists had for a period already advocated increased emphasis on conventional options and conventional deterrence. And there was a conditionality link to the lowering of the nuclear threshold uh, allow around the millennial shift, namely that uh, this was a temporary solution only until conventional capabilities were back on track. By 2010, uh, this conditionality seemed to have been met. At least uh, uh, conventional capabilities would be uh, back on track in not too long. So this larger focus on conventional tools in 2010 was in fact in line with military preferences. So we come to the last case, which is 2014. Putin's last uh, chance to redeem himself and prove uh, Western warmongers right in terms of their offensive or Russian offensive, offensive nuclear strategy. If the restraint in the 2010 doctrine was primarily the result of Medvedev's intervention, then surely Putin would now set things uh, straight. He didn't, and rather he went in the opposite direction by introducing a new term, non-nuclear deterrence. At the same time, however, nuclear posturing was significant with strategic bomber flight, attack profiles against several European countries, uh, alleged uh, uh, and alleged unprecedented nuclear saber rat rattling, uh, in addition to capability developments continuing apace. So what explains this uh, at times contradictory communication? Again, external uh, conditions can explain the turn toward uh, non-nuclear tools of strat in strategy. The balance of conventional and nuclear forces were now imp improving from the Russian perspective, and although Russia remained inferior among most parameters, they were certainly gaining a competitive edge. It may again be the case that posturing and capability balancing could have supplanted the need for offensive declaratory strategy from the Russian perspective. Still, it almost looks like a missed opportunity for Putin, as he could have driven home uh, the worst nightmares of Western policymakers in this particular period. But he didn't, which is intriguing, and, and he reiterated uh, this uh, reduced emphasis on nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, well, he's done it several times in the period since. That, uh, the latest instance was his statements uh, at Valdai just a couple of weeks ago when he explicitly said that Russia does not have a nuclear doctrine of preemption and that Russia would have to be under attack before it would contemplate nuclear first use. 
In this period, there were several uh, Russian military strategists who were arguing for the inefficacy of nuclear balancing against the types of emerging threats that Russia was facing, and that new approaches were needed, both conventional and non-conventional, to deal with them. The, uh, moreover, they made the case that the credibility of nuclear deterrence against such threats was low. Again, this signifies a larger emphasis on additional means for deterring and fending off threats before having to reach, for, uh, reach the nuclear threshold. And even if, even in this period, we saw uh, more institutionalized civilian control over strategy formulation, the content remained in line with military preferences and in line with the emergent uh, militarization, I would say, of the Russian security policy agenda, whereby increasing aspects of domestic and international life have become a matter of Russian military security. So again, in this last case, a sustained military dominance over nuclear strategy content. To conclude, I want to make three points. First, that Russian nuclear strategists are struggling with the same deterrent challenges as other nuclear strategists. How much warfighting capability to demonstrate or communicate in order to make deterrence credible? This has been a central question for Russian strategists since the early 1990s, and evidently before that as well. And uh, they've come up with different solutions at different points in time. They have not resolved it, in part because it is difficult or impossible to resolve. This is the inherent tension in any deterrent strategy. And this is the reason I claim that Russian strategy is primarily about deterrence. Russian strategists and policymakers are no more interested in nuclear war and nuclear calamity than any Western strategist or policymaker. But Russian strategists are aware that they should be prepared to use nuclear weapons if push comes to shove. U.S. nuclear strategy is to deter war, but if deterrence fails, to be prepared for a limited nuclear war and come out on top. Russian conventional capabilities are not on par with U.S. conventional capabilities, which means that in a large-scale conventional conflict, Russia would likely resort to nuclear weapons first. But the conditionality that Russian leaders and officially, officials repeatedly express is that this would only be considered when the very existence of the state is under threat. That, that is, once their strategic assets are under attack, be it uh, conventional or nuclear. I insist that this is a different strategy from, than what some Western strategists claim to be the Russian strategy of, nuclear strategy of coercion whereby Russia would use nuclear weapons to ag uh, pursue aggressive policies toward, for example, NATO countries. Russia knows, as, was, as well as we do, that any confrontation with NATO would likely go nuclear and that they could lose it. They have no interest in validating their theory of sustained conventional inferiority. Their military writings that they have, uh, demonstrate that they have very little confidence that nuclear weapons would get them out of that calamity, and they have no explicitly communicated confidence that they would. So why Western strategists continue to suggest that Russia would want to get themselves into that calamity is, is beyond me. Second, I think the balancing behavior is interesting in that it demonstrates the Russian willingness to compensate strategically no matter what the nature of political relations. We seem to think that uh, um, the speech that Putin made on the 1st of March this year, for example, where, where he displayed a number of new uh, Russian strategic systems, was insp uh, inspired by the current state of political relations. I will not claim that it was totally untainted by this, but still, every decision underlying every single system that we saw was taken probably 10 to 15 years ago. The balancing aspect means that conventional modernization or any other technological advance on, their, on the part of Russia may reduce nuclear risks by reducing their reliance on nuclear options. But the flip side of that is that any technological leap uh, the US or other Western powers make may cause reverberations in Russian strategy and that it could revert to nuclear options if that is perceived as the best response. Third and final point. Orthodoxy dictates that militarization of policy is a bad thing and that the military may drag the polity into conflicts it does not want. In the current context, 
military dominance seems to be inflicting a sense of sobriety on Russian nuclear strategy. In all the cases of strategy I examined, there were always more offensive options proposed than the ones that were included in strategy, in the Russian strategy debate, that is. Indeed, some suggest that the current political leadership in Russia is far more enamored with nuclear possibilities than are their military brethren. This means that the current trajectory, uh, which I depict as more responsible than at least some people in this town would, uh, could change in the future through political direction, through generational change or the like. We need a solid and a sound understanding as possible of a Russian nuclear strategy in order to try and influence that strategy in the future. If I'm right, and Russian generals still believe, like their Soviet predecessors, that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought, then this should be the starting point for Western attempts to communicate and start a dialogue. Misguided strategy interpretation begets misguided strategy with a low likelihood of producing the types of strategic outcomes that we seek. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Well, yeah, I'd like to turn it over to you for yeah. a couple of minutes of comments. Thank you. Um, so I thought that was excellent and very interesting. Um, I'd like to raise a few points that come out of this. I think I'm very much in agreement with Krista on most of her points. Um, so in many ways, what I will be doing is highlighting and perhaps expanding a little bit on a few of them. Um, I mean, one of the really interesting things, if you do go back to the 90s and the Yeltsin doctrinal debate and everything leading up to that, to Zappa 99, the 2000 doctrine, is that you see very clear evidence of a fight over this going on within uh, the Russian MOD bureaucracy, within the Russian political um, leadership. That you have a group of people led by the man who was then Minister of Defense, Sergeyev, who was a former Strategic Rocket Forces commander. Um, which basically argued, we've got the nukes, we don't need to worry about the rest of it, they'll, they'll deter all the things. And then you have Poshnin, who was chief of um, general staff, saying, I don't think that's going to work. They're not credible, these aren't the wars we're fighting, we need to build up our conventional capability. And what happens is that in 99, 2000, Sergeyev wins, but I would actually date well before the 2010 Doctrine, very soon after that. The 2000 Doctrine stays on the books, but Sergeyev gets kicked out. Um, and Russia does, in fits and starts, and clumsily and ineffectively, start investing in conventional capabilities. And I think a lot of this is because of this understanding that it's not credible to threaten nuclear weapons use in most circumstances. You're not going to deter uh, an adversary under those conditions. And you know, I think you can make other arguments about why, why that eventually, you know, why that argument won. But I think it is really important to understand the Russians really are thinking about the credibility of their deterrent. They are trying to deter. Uh, which I think in the West, we often forget. When we think about Russian strategy, we forget that the Russians are trying to deter, well, us most of the time. And for the United States especially, I think we are a little bit out of practice with being deterred and have reached um, something of a point where the notion that um, somebody would constrain and limit our freedom of action, uh, that is, deter us from doing something, is fundamentally abhorrent and needs to be eliminated. Uh, during the Cold War, I think there was a certain acceptance of mutual deterrence. Maybe no, you know, nobody was particularly happy with it and people tested the boundaries. But today, there is this notion that you will do anything you can to preclude being deterred, right? The entire A2AD debate is, and discussion is about how do you eliminate an adversary's capacity to defend themselves. I mean, that's fundamentally what you're talking about when you talk about A2AD, is, hey, this, other, this prospective adversary can actually defend themselves from us. Um, what do we do about that? We're not used to that. So th this is about deterrence. Now, the other thing that I think is really interesting that I want to highlight is um, the tendency to focus on capabilities rather than strategy. And I think that is particularly problematical in the case of Russia because Russian strategy and Russian capabilities have been mismatched pretty much all along. 
and you can, and I do, and if you really want me to, I'll go into it, outline why that is. You know, my arguments have a lot to do with bureaucratic um, infighting within Russia, with historical ways that Russian nuclear forces have evolved. But think about this. Uh, Vladimir Putin has made very clear, and recently several times, including uh, at Valdai, that um, Russian nuclear forces, now I would argue he's talking about strategic nuclear forces here, are about um, responding to an attack, uh, presumably from the United States, that threatens Russia. Okay, then why do you have so many ICBMs? I mean, all the ICBMs do is mean that you're going to have to launch really, really fast, that you're not going to have a chance to test out the warning, that you've got a whole bunch of systems that are extremely vulnerable to a US first strike. Why, you know, why, and until recently, most of those were in silos. Now it's a little bit more evenly based with uh, the road mobile systems that are a little more survivable. But wow, that depends on having warning, and you're not really talking about warning, you're talking about a bolt from the blue attack when a lot of your road mobile ICBMs are going to be sitting at their bases, and also your submarines, to the extent that that is a more survivable uh, capability. Well, for Russia, those are going to be sitting in port too. So why do you build and posture that way if that's actually your strategy? Um, but the alternative is that Russia's planning a debilitating first strike on the United States, which also can't be the case because that's not possible because the United States does keep um, the majority of its uh, capabilities on submarines, which are at sea patrolling. So it's, it just it doesn't make sense, um, which means that you can't just look at capabilities. You do have to listen to what people tell you about what their forces are for because that's how deterrence works. Um, the other thing that I want to then bring out, though, is this question about strategic and non-strategic capabilities. Now, yes, all nuclear use is strategic um, in a certain sense. In another sense, we're talking about deterrence versus war fighting. And we're talking about smaller, lower yield weapons which could be used in a conflict that would not destroy the world unless, of course, they lead to an escalation ladder where eventually you destroy the world. And the argument that Western analysts who believe that Russian doctrine is escalate to de-escalate are making isn't based on Russia's strategic systems. It's based on Russia's non-strategic systems. And it's based um, to a large extent on the fact that, boy, are there a lot of those. Russia has, you know, conservative estimate about 2,000 uh, non-strategic weapons. It's also been emphasizing in some of its newer systems uh, dual capable, uh, the dual capable nature of those systems. So Caliber and Iskander can be uh, deployed in a nuclear um, version or in a conventional version. There's no particular reason to think that anything we're seeing now is anything other than conventional. But you know, this is where you get all of this uh, nuclear-capable missiles going you know, to Kaliningrad. Well, yes, they're nuclear-capable. That doesn't mean that it's a nuclear system that's going to Kaliningrad. People get very excited. So why? If yeah. Russia's entire strategy is about responding to an attack, what are these things even for, right? Why do you need them at all? Why are you suddenly building them? Why are you emphasizing them? And then when you do get into doctrine, you do have this um, interesting blip of a couple of years ago in new naval doctrine which is the only place I can find a doctrine where non-strategic, Russian non-strategic nuclear forces are addressed. And it's a very convoluted discussion which does talk about having the credibility to threaten a de-escalatory nuclear strike with these things. Which, you know, if you tend to believe that that's what the Russians are going to do, you're going to think that means that the Russians plan to carry out such a strike. If you don't, then, well, de-escalatory doesn't necessarily mean first strike. Um, credible <coughs> threat doesn't necessarily mean use. But I would say that this is a problematical uh, piece of doctrine for all the things that Vladimir Putin uh, has said and for overall understanding what Russian doctrine is. And finally, I kind of want to come back to where Kristen started with this argument that um, Russia will use its nuclear weapons uh, to coerce innocent Baltic countries into submission. Um, and I think what's interesting here is the coercive capacity of nuclear weapons, which there have been a couple of books that have come out recently on this topic debating this. 
Um, I would argue that it, you know, I'm not going to go into a discussion of these books, but what I think, um, whether or not you believe that uh, nuclear weapons are effective at coercion or you believe nuclear weapons aren't effective for coercion, I think what um, the literature shows very capable, capably is that leaders of states that possess nuclear weapons tend to like to think that nuclear weapons can be used for, for coercion. Does that mean they plan to use those weapons? Probably not, but they do think that a certain amount of brandishing, a certain amount of talking about it, a certain amount of reminding the world that we can do this can be useful. Um, now, again, the evidence may suggest that that doesn't work, but that doesn't seem to stop them from doing it again and again. And I think that has a lot to do with the way that the Russians talk about their nuclear weapons. I think that goes a long way to explaining the emphasis on dual capable systems. Um, I also think it's incredibly dangerous because it is, in the end, not an effective tool of coercion. And it is um, likely, instead, to make other people think that the Russians have a much more escalatory doctrine than they actually have. It is also, uh, insofar as it pushes the United States towards developing uh, lower yield nuclear weapons of its own, uh, can, lead a, can lead Russia away from this new emphasis on conventional capabilities, which I actually think is a positive thing, right? It, it goes into this, okay, we need, deterrent, we need deterrents that are credible. We need ways to keep this war from going nuclear if it does happen. Um, not that they really think that that can happen, but that can be done. I prefer to keep things in that conventional space as a you know, person who lives on planet Earth. Um, but I think when, I, I do think the Russians have a lot of explaining to do, and I think they are at fault with the, with the, with the brandishing, with the hope that uh, coercive, if not actual use of nuclear weapons uh, can be effective uh, in, in pushing the United States into this direction, which I think is going to have these secondary effects of pulling the Russians back into the nuclear game, potentially changing their um, doctrine into what, it, what we actually fear it is, and putting us in a place where escalation um, is very plausible. And you know the capacity of the United States Russia or both of us to control escalation is not something I am particularly enthusiastic about testing. I am a fan of deterrence holding, um, not uh, uh, and holding at a fairly low level uh, rather than uh, trying to see if you can uh, get it back in the midst of a conflict because you're, you're, you're you know you're gonna you have these weapons because you're credible so I'm gonna have these weapons to prove that I'm credible and we're all gonna take turns uh, showing how credible we are until we're all dead um, so I, I think um, this is the argument we're having in the United States I think it's really important to make sure the Russians understand that this is the argument we're having in the United States and that they have a role in clearing this up because if Vladimir Putin keeps talking about his plans for strategic nuclear weapons that's great I believe him, but I'm still not sure. I, I have my view on what the non-strategic systems are for, but it would be really helpful if somebody from the Kremlin made that a little bit clearer. Brilliant, thank you. Just listening to you speak, and I was thinking that the coercion deterrence language is very much one where you know, your own capabilities are always about deterrence, and the adversary's deterrence is always about coercion and the ability to coerce you. Or war fighting. Or war fighting. Um, I, before I turn it over to the audience, I was just thinking, listening to both of these brilliant presentations, and, and I do want to issue two questions to, to our speaker and our discussant. But Kristen, I was thinking, you, you began really by, by looking at some of the arguments that have been made here in the policy community, and sort of listening to them, I've heard over the years, what are de facto a couple different arguments being made, and, I, and I'd like to get your sense on which of these things you think are true on Russian nuclear strategy. Because one is uh, very limited nuclear use of a couple nuclear weapons for demonstration. This is de facto the Matt Croning argument that early on in conflict they'll fire three nuclear missiles and we need to have nuclear missiles to fire back. Another one is not escalate to de-escalate, it's escalate to maintain. That in a conflict, having made successful conventional gains, 
Russia will use nuclear weapons in a limited nuclear theater strike to, as a war termination strategy. The third one is our strategy of flexible response, the first nuclear, the first offset, which is that in a conventional conflict, when losing, only then will Russia use nuclear weapons. This, of course, is still very problematic because it gets into some of what I've encountered here to be um, called non-consensual warmness, right? Which is, if you, read, if you read a lot of strategy documents in the United States, you basically get that there's a strong belief that the United States should be able to have a limited conventional war with pure nuclear adversaries, and that they should like let us win mm -hmm. and not use nuclear weapons when they're losing. They shouldn't deter us. Well, the, they should just have the nuclear weapons, but then never use them even when they're losing. And really, nobody thought that this would be the case prior to, I think, 1992, but at some point, people began believing in this fantasy that a country would have all these nuclear weapons, and in a conventional conflict, which could prove existential for them, at least politically, they should let us win anyway. It's, it, it's fascinating, but anyway, so this is the, the flexible, flexible response argument. Um, and in general, I would add, how old do you subscribe to the position, and I'll put my cards on the table, that I hold that long ago in the early to mid-1980s, Soviet general staff began to see conventional precision-guided weapons as having the same missions as tactical nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And that there really began to emerge an independent conventional war option between nuclear states for some limited amount of time. And that meant that non-strategic nuclear weapons would de facto be elevated into the role of escalation management. Mm -hmm. And that may be where they are today, and perhaps this whole thing was sort of in the 1980s, but, but I, I would love to hear you weigh in at least on those three options. Um, and, and of course, Oya. Mm -hmm. I was listening to you talk. I, I, I keep struggling to really understand wh what is the right mix when we look at sort of adversary strategy between how much weight we should give to doctrine, capability, exercise, and this thing. We sort of triangulate our perception of it. And so I'd like to ask you, you, you um, you're certainly a veteran of, of, of this conversation uh, here in Washington, D.C. So there's an argument to be made that um, the doctrine as a political document is, is inherently ambiguous. It covers all your bases, and, and it doesn't paint you into any corner. So if in an actual crisis, you have a lot of room to maneuver. And that, and that while doctrines are relevant, they're ultimately quite limited in what they can portray about adversary intent for a couple of reasons. One is they're principally not war-fighting documents. In the event of a conventional war, it's very difficult to see Valery Gerasimov say, you know, I think it might be time to use nuclear weapons, but I'm not sure. Someone get me 2014 military doctrine, I don't want to get this wrong. Remind me what we wrote there, right? This is issue one. Like, to what extent is that actually going to be relevant in any military contingency? Um, issue two is that doctrines, well, it's different views. I, I have a very extreme view that I think that, like, in many ways, declaratory policy is, is largely a policy community jobs program where no adversary believes the other adversary's declaratory policy at all, ever, and that the only point of declaratory policy is to sell your nuclear arsenal and nuclear force modernization so that countries don't believe that you're a nuclear warmonger, right? And so you paint your, all your capabilities as defensive and your strategy is reasonable, but actually nobody on the other side really believes in declaratory policy, as Kristen said. There are always analysts that say there's an evil secret clause in a secret Russian military doctrine that might say completely opposite things of the actual military doctrine. Nobody believes Soviets no first use pledge. Nobody believes, I think, China's no first use pledge. At least the people that focus on China keep, keep writing that. So the question is, how much weight, what can we learn from doctrine? Because capability investments modernization are 30-year strategic plans, right? The choices. Mm -hmm. Doctrines can change every four years with this pen. The doctrine said this, I've changed five words. So intent, what doctrine states declaratory policy can change every couple of years, but the forces, the excise, they, they might tell us something else. How do we reconcile this? How do we weigh them? What, what's, if, if you can give us your insights, what's, what's, the, right, what's the right weight uh, to the declaratory policy we should give in our analysis? So, so with that said, Kristen, I hope I can turn, turn to you first and get your thoughts on the first set of questions. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you, Olya, for your excellent comments, and uh, Mike for excellent questions. Um, start with Matt Cronin. <laughs> Do I have to start with Matt Cronin? You don't have to yeah. start with Matt Cronin. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, um, well, my take would be 
I would lean toward, lean toward the third option rather than the first two that you portray. Um, and, the, and the reason for that is um, that I have, I have difficulty seeing uh, the, uh, the utility, the war termination utility in the Matt Kronig option of very early limited use. I, I have not seen anything that convinces me that the Russians are convinced this would produce the outcome that they would be, uh, would be seeking. Um, but, but I do think that, I mean, uh, my perspective is that uh, the, the flexible response option, uh, at least that resonates most with, with what I've, I've read from their strategy debates and from the, uh, what it's possible to, to discern from the capabilities that they are developing. Uh, and I certainly subscribe to the point that you make that uh, this conviction in, in Western capitals that it would be possible to enter into a conflict with the Russians and that it could somehow uh, be, uh, that you could have crisis stability in a large scale conflict with the Russians. I think that's, that's absolute nonsense. I, I don't understand where anyone got, got that idea that that uh, in a conflict that potentially would be perceived as existential to the Russians, uh, presumably a conflict that would take place in either in Russia or on their periphery, if that, if that conflict ha had direct implications for Russian territory, I think there is absolutely no reason to, to expect that, that you could contain Russian nuclear use. And in part, I believe that precisely because that is what they are saying and have been saying for, for quite some time. Um, so, so that's the reason I'm leaning, leaning toward the, the third option and, and toward um, believing that, that for the Russians, uh, nuclear weapons <coughs> remain sort of the last uh, recurs to, to survival in an existential, in an existential conflict. Uh, and I still believe that even though I talk about how they uh, believe that conventional capabilities may uh, sort of add, uh, add options on the ladder of escalation, that doesn't mean that they have solved their conventional inferiority problem, which means that, as I said, that they will, they will, run, into, into, they will run into conventional shortcomings before uh, an adversary like the U.S. And, and I think this is the reason they sustain, uh, for example, uh, their non-strategic options. Um, and I wanted to make one more point on the, um, on the utility of dual use, and it's in part in reference to what you said and in part in reference mm -hmm. to what uh, Olya said. I think it's quite interesting. Well, Olya, you said that you prefer the conventional option, and we present the conventional option as more responsible, evidently, because we are, none of us are interested in nuclear weapons use. But then uh, in the Russian deliberation, you see uh, sort of discussion of how, uh, of the utility of dual use, which means that it's the combination that is perceived as potent. Um, but, but I would still emphasize that uh, the conventional option of all these dual use systems is seen from the Russian perspective as more potent precisely because there is a nuclear option, but you could still make the argument that even though they are dual use capabilities, the nuclear option is there for deterrent purposes. Mm -hmm. But ev evidently, uh, there are a lot of problems connected with the, with the uh, with the fact that they are uh, dual use in terms of uh, d distinguishing uh, uh, problems and, and uh, well, the destabilizing nature of those particular capabilities. But I think it's quite uh, interesting to observe the, the Russian discussion of sort of the conventional option and how that may, may be, how that is a solution to, to their problems where, while not really uh, deliberating the destabilizing nature of the uh, or the destabilizing characteristic of those same capabilities. 
Okay. So you subscribe to the primarily flexible response interpretation, uh -huh. but do you see non-strategic nuclear weapons as in the role of escalation management in high and conventional conflict? Because one of the big challenges, right, that we are we are collectively trying to negotiate and understand is having not solved for the problem of nuclear weapons in 20th century conflict, which is why we've not had a great power war for 70 years. Mm -hmm. um, we're still trying to figure out what are the real possibilities for high and conventional conflict? How long can it be? Where can it be? What are the potential boundaries of it? Do you think that, that the Russians, sorry to ask a follow-up, but that the Russians have basically slotted non-strategic nuclear weapons into this escalation management role somewhere between high end conventional capability and obviously between strategic and nuclear exchange? Uh, I, th I, I think that it's, it's an, an option that they would entertain given certain uh, characteristics of an evolving conflict, yes. And, and I, think, I, mean, I think that's part of the reason they, su they sustain those uh, sub-strategic uh, capabilities. Uh, that, that that would be one way of, uh, of communicating basically Sust sustain the intention to to uh, continue the fight. Right. Well, thank you. And and Oya, can, can you make any sense of my ramblings on doctrine and, sure, and declaratory sure. policy? Sure. But before I do that, I will. I'll, I'll just to the tail end of that. I will say that I think I don't think the Russians think escalation can be managed, but I think at the point where there's no other option, they'll give yeah. it a shot. Yeah. I think that's what it comes down to. It's where it's unmanaged escalation. No, because no, because it's. I, I really think the most important thing Vladimir Putin has said in the last couple of years on this topic is, what, what good is a world without Russia? Right at the point where there's no other option, and understand that the <clears throat> Russians do think that war with the United States looks like a early concrete effort to eliminate Russia's nuclear and other capacities to retaliate, which is effectively a world without Russia. Um, it'll kill a lot of Russians, it'll take down the Russian government, it, you know. And in part, and this actually brings me to answer your question, they think this because um, it's our doctrine. Mm -hmm. So countries do listen to one another's doctrines. Um, the, the US doctrine is a driver of Russian understanding of how the US would fight a war. Um, we say or we reserve the right to use nuclear weapons whenever we decide it's in our interest. And we also say that um, the way we will use them is counterforce, that we will go against the adversary's military capabilities. We, uh, the United States sometimes couches that in moral terms, right, that this is better than going after um, population centers or something else. But you know, you're going to kill an awful lot of people with your counterforce attacks. So you know, don't, don't get too excited about being a good guy under those conditions. Um, so the Russians understand that the other piece that the Russians look at, which I think is also an important um, component, is how America actually fights wars, which pretty much fits that. It's not you know, in the conventional realm uh, to date, but that's pretty much what we do. We go after adversary capabilities. We try to eliminate their capacity to retaliate. Uh, we do it fairly overwhelmingly. Um, so I would argue that the flip side of this is um, what do you do when you look at what the Russians do? So I think particularly with nuclear weapons, you do have to look at doctrine because nuclear weapons are about deterrence. And deterrence is about what you say you're going to do. It is about the threats. Um, Capability is part of it, but again, historically, Russian capabilities and the way the Russians really think about using these weapons are pretty disconnected. Um, so you do have to pay a lot of attention to what they say. It doesn't mean that we do. We evidently do not, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't. And I think the other thing you pay attention to if you are thinking about when deterrence fails, how does this, what happens, is you look at how they fight wars. Uh, and you look at how that's evolving, and you look at the trend lines and how they fight wars. And so far, what we've seen in how the Russians fight wars is sometimes an unnervingly, if not low, then different than expected bar for the use of force, but very uh, limited actual use of force and an effort to keep that constrained, which sometimes works better and sometimes works worse, which I think is valuable to take under advisement. I do think the nuclear taboo holds in Russia. Um, I think that's why you have these debates about the credibility of nuclear weapons. 
I also think the desire to use nuclear weapons coercively, as I said before, is very prevalent. Yeah, absolutely. Nuclear coercion is ultimately a little bit of a religion. You either either part of the community that thinks nuclear weapons can be used for coercion, or you're part of the community that thinks right. that, that they're not but, effective. But coercion, like deterrence, isn't about use, right? It's about convincing the adversary that you'll do something you don't actually want to do. So, I mean, I think that, that's also important to understand, that coercion, like deterrence, is not about actual war planning. It's about freaking out the other guy. All right, so I think we have uh, 30 minutes for questions. I'd like to turn this over to the audience. Please just start off by restating your name and at least have a question. Hank, I'll start with you first, if you could. And you have a mic, right? Yes, Michael. No, 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 no. Yes. Wait one second. Hi, I'm Hank Gaffney. I spent uh, 13 years in the Office of Secretary of Defense doing, doing nuclear weapons and 13 years of uh, dialogue with uh, Iskran in, uh, in Russia, including 15 trips, trips to Russia. Um, let me just say that in our work in NATO, we never found any limited options. And even up through General Galvin in the late 80s, uh, he was talking about two days to nuclear weapons, in which case SACUR was all going to launch all 7,227 warheads, some of which had no launchers. <laughs> <laughs> the absurdity of it was immense. Um, but, um, and of course, we had buried the notion of that by 1975, when we did studies for Senator Nunn. Um, but the whole thing continues. And if you go into the international relations literature, nobody knows anything about it. The NATO provisional political guidelines for the initial use of nuclear weapons has never been published. Or nobody even knows what. And we just gave it up and worked solely on the conventional capabilities. But uh, I don't know. That document we call the BPG, my British colleague and I sat down and said, do we make this secret or top secret? And we said, it's supposed to be about deterrence. Let's make it secret because we know all the secret stuff goes right to Moscow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't know whether the Russians ever or the Soviets ever picked it up. Okay. So I'll uh, just make that comment. Uh, yeah. By the way, I was the one who... Uh, uh, set up the process and laid out the options which led to Euro missiles. Hank. Hank, do you have a question? For the, uh, but for the my, my question is, um, how, how can we, f how, why do people not know all this? Mm. So I, I think you partially answered that question, right? Let, let's make it, you made let's it secret. Because you made it secret, Hank. because you made it secret. I really think that um, a much underused signaling tool is uh, words openly stated and ears, you know, actually listening and, and minds open to actually hearing what the other guy says. We're so busy trying to send uh, complicated and subtle signals and interpret the other guy's complicated and subtle signals that we don't actually say things to one another and listen to what the other one says. Okay. Um, questions? Carlin? Just keep in mind, um, Hank used up the only comment from the floor for the session, so from now on, we only have to, we can only take questions. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman with a number of institutions. I'm also a recovering Sovietologist, and I want to commend CSIS for putting this together because it's long overdue. Uh, my bias is that I think the chances of Russia invading the Baltics is about the same as NATO invading Kaliningrad. So with that as background, I want to ask a couple of questions. First, Kristen. What is so the that central? High or low? I'm confused. It's about less than <laughs> it's less than zero. Just checking. Um, you never know. Kristen, what is the, the the centerpiece, the argument, the thesis of your dissertation that really compels it? I'd like you to state that crisply. And for the entire board, uh, to what degree is Russian Soviet think uh, Russian thinking uh, a follow-on to Sokolovsky Third Edition '68 continuity, or is there any differences? And and finally. Uh, during the Cold War, I would argue the United States really never understood the Soviet Union because of mirror imaging and all sorts of other intellectual constraints. The fact is that the word deterrence does not exist in the same way in Russian as it does in, in, in English. Um, 
With that background, given the fact that we have virtually nobody in the government who has any experience dealing with arms control and Russia, and the fact that people have forgotten how destructive nuclear weapons are, we casually throw those terms around, how do we ensure that the U.S. government, including Congress, is better informed on these issues rather than prima facie regarding Russia as the enemy and taking seriously that nuclear weapons could be used uh, with abandon? Okay. Thank you, Alan. All great questions. So, Kristen, I, I think we'll turn to you to find out what the thesis of your dis dissertation is. Yeah, so I'm still <laughs> struggling with that, no. And so my key argument basically is that Russian nuclear strategy uh, is about balancing uh, military inferior inferiority and uh, it's a product of uh, the uh, preferences of military actor, Russian military actors uh, for how to fight wars. And in the current constellation, that produces a strategy that's much less offensive than generally depicted in the Western uh, discourse. Okay. Thank you, Kristen. And um, any comments on to what extent is, is sort of current Russian nuclear strategy or doctrine a follow on to Soviet thinking? Um, and they're all in general comment that the United States never really understood Soviet Union was mostly busy doing mirror imaging. <laughs> how, do we, how do we get better? Yeah, and, and, how, do, and how do we get better at all that? What do we do about? Uh, I think there is a lot of continuity from Soviet uh, strategic uh, thought, uh, and uh, and just studying the strategy debates in the early 90s. I mean, that's that's basically the continuance of the debates that were going on in the Soviet Union in the in the late 80s when they were uh, trying to calibrate uh, str uh, Russian strategy in uh, excuse me Soviet strategy in light of the changing uh, external conditions and uh, changing technological developments. So I think that a lot of the ideas that, that I've been talking about today that have been reverberating in the Russian strategy debate were already there and were already present in the Soviet strategy debate in the late uh, 80s. Uh, so I think there, there is a lot of uh, continuity, and then there are evidently there's there are some elements that have uh, changed. I think that uh, the uh, increased focus on uh, non-nuclear elements is a sort of a novel uh, is novel content in and the way that Russian thinking about deterrence has evolved <laughs> over time. So this whole notion that you can make use of conventional and non-conventional capabilities to deter a potential adversary, I think, is a, is a change and an evolution in Russian strategic, strategic thought from the Soviet period. So there are, certain, but so there are elements of both continuity and, uh, and change, I think. Okay. Would you like to comment on some of this? Yeah. So, I mean, I think absolutely both continuity and change. Um, there are things that are very consistent in Russian military thought going back a very long time. Um, I also think that the Russians are capable of adapting, that they, they do watch how prospective adversaries fight, they gain experiences from their own conflicts, they try to integrate new technologies, varying degrees of success, um, just like we all do. And I mean, part of it, but they see it through the lens, right, of the historical thinking, the, the ways of approaching both conflict as a whole and uh, nuclear weapons. Um, you know, you can talk about zerzhevenia, ustrashenia, all these different translations of deterrence. They do believe in deterrence. I mean, they, it, it's not that they don't have a concept of deterrence. They're trying to deter us. Um, so, you know, the, the, we might, you know, they might use different words under different mm -hmm. conditions, um, and some of them are very normative and value-laden because you're using them to make a specific case in a specific article. But overall, I mean, I think a, a lot of this is very much about reminding the United States that there are certain things Russia doesn't want you to do and hoping to God that that's credible. Um, how do you educate the U.S. government? So I wouldn't say there's no one in the U.S. government who understands Russia or arms control. I would say that there's, um, it would be nice to have more people, uh, particularly at very, very, very senior levels. Um, but, you know, there, there are very solid people. The question is how much influence do they have? How much capacity do they have to get points across? Are they making the policies and are they talking to the Russians? Um, and how to educate, you know, how do you educate governments that, look, the government has to want to be educated, right? Otherwise, you are 
you're talking to yourselves, which we're very good at at Washington. Washington. I mean, it's uh, that, that talk about jobs programs, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. what's employed me for most of my career. Um, but you know, you. I think if you if you're going to give up on talking to the Americans, then you have to start talking to the Russians and the Europeans and everybody else about how you manage a United States that isn't listening. Um, I also think that uh, I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, I think you do keep trying. I think you you write, you physically go in, and you have the conversations. You talk to people on the Hill, which also plays an important role in policymaking. Uh, where I think there are both competent people and interested people, and uh, you know, muddle through that way. Well, if I can make a brief comment, since you made the question to the whole panel, Harlan, I think the continuity mostly stems from the second revolution in military affairs, when mm -hmm. conventional weapons began to take back the realm of warfare after 1970s, <clears throat> and Soviet general staff was reacting was broadly characterized as air land battle, but the rising predominance of conventional weapons and the ability for the United States, at least how they perceived it, to be able to conduct an independent conventional war and potentially even succeed and win it. Other things that Kristen alluded to also then stem from 1990s, which is one, how they observed the United States conduct war, which is airspace blitzkrieg and decapitating strike, not prolonged war of attrition, to a number of countries, Iraq, Serbia, Iraq again, um, and last but not least, of course, also changing, changing threat perceptions, right, which is the transition somewhat in the 1990s of, towards late 1990s of how Russian Federation political leadership began to regard the United States. Um, and on deterrence, I think what, at least what I found is that in Russian discourse, the language on deterrence is far less formulaic as it is in the United States and far less disciplined. So people here who would say, you know, well, course of credibility is capability, you know, plus resolve, time signaling and all that. They don't write it that way. And so if you read it from that perspective, it's very frustrating because they model the terms by denial, by punishment, it's like this. But they have a very clear understanding of how they're trying to shape adversary behavior, adversary thinking, where they're trying to get to. It's just not nearly as rigid and sort of Anglo-Saxon discipline in that sense, but it does, but, but it's, 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 it's not that hard to decode. Um, okay, more questions. I'm gonna start taking two at a time, so we'll go a bit faster uh, with you right here. Coming from semiology, um, I am a linguist. My name is Elena. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Um, incidentally, I work at FSI, but a different FSI, Foreign Service Institute on the DOS side. And previously, I come from a career uh, with the DOD, teaching at DLAFLC. Now, my area of specialization, and forgive me, this goes directly to the question afterwards, uh, is um, evaluative statements, polyphony in fictional and non-fictional discourse how we can distinguish hidden meaning from the artificially constructed meaning which is supposed to just, it's a decoy. So this is my scientific background. And I'm used, uh, normally I'm utilized as a Beyond 3 instructor and th that means I'm teaching people for the higher ranges on the ILR scale, uh, levels four and five. Uh, and my last student is, specializes in she is actually right now in Moscow, and um, what we are discussing today is specifically what we were doing with her for about five months. So um, knowing all that, um, I can't really address a number of issues that reverberate. There were several points in each one of your statements that are really, um, are, I have strong opinions, and I wholeheartedly uh, subscribe to some of them and disagree on some. But Yesterday, Anya Polikova came up, the Brookings Institution released this uh, report. I haven't even had a chance to carefully read through it. But my point is that today we can't really speak about strategic nuclear armaments as a deterrent or conventional armaments doctrine as one of the main courses of Putin. I came to this. I don't know for how many years this has been in existence, but I became firmly convinced uh, mid-2013. And from that point on, I'm all the more convinced that AI is where the interest lies. So uh, artificial intelligence as something which is, in Russian we say this, so the offensive is the most potent and powerful defense and preservation. Um, Putin is yes, all about... We say that in America is the best defense well, of the strong yeah. defense. Well, yeah. anyway, Everyone so... Everyone in the World War I said that. 
We so, call it the cult of the offensive. So yeah. Putin is all about self-preservation. He will never be able to step down. And you know, at this you know, point, I, so, I, so I question. I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt. What do you think about the question? Oh. Yeah, what do you think about Putin's AI, about? as stated by Anya Polikova in her research, which currently became available? Okay, which I have not read. Mm. Not really. Well, I haven't read it carefully, but I looked through it. All right. Um, okay, let me take a second question. Uh, I'll reach a little bit further back now. Gentleman back there has hung for a while. So my name is Wayne Edmondson. I've actually served in Eastern Europe. Uh, in, uh, as an information operations guy for the for the U.S. military, and I guess my question is: is um, if you believe that the the nuclear strategy is a broader part of the Russian national defense strategy, um, then what's the motive? I think a lot of Americans and people in the Pentagon believe that Russia is a nuclear power that does offensive things that are not nuclear. So, <clears throat> so what is it that you know is the motivation for their offensive operations and in information warfare and in information operations, and why is it so counter to their nuclear strategy, which seems like all defensive, all deterrence? Okay, you know what? I'm actually going to take a third question because we're running for a bit. Hans, did you? Yeah, well, patient. not to put a too fine point on it, uh, but obviously what what you're explaining here. Thanks very much for a great event and really really interesting comments and analysis. But of course, at the nuclear posture review, I mean, this, the perception that there is a significant change is at the core of that review and its recommendations for what we therefore need to do now. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I've heard people explain that they brought together the entire intelligence community and looked at everything about the, the Russian strategy and they came to the conclusion that there is something significantly new going on. I mean, I don't know, of course, if that is true or not, but that's what I've been told. And it was about lowering the threshold. It was about more risk of use. General Hyten has been out there many times talking about that not only is it not not only is it escalate to de-escalate, but in his his you know vocabulary, it's, it's escalate to win. Um, so he they're okay, banging away. Can a country on, fight a war and want to win it? No, no, no. I mean, I'm, that's I'm, madness, I'm right? just saying that, that, that is there the, a non-escalate to one strategy, like escalate for the hell of it. So the <laughs> the essence of all of this is that it's at the you know. The, the, the fundamentally different perception is at the core of U.S. nuclear policy, mm -hmm. where it's going right now, and the perception of what the Russians are doing. I mean, I'm not asking What's the explain point? this or you know analyze this, but I'm just I'm just wondering uh, why you think what you see is so you know fundamentally different from what people say they see the, the authors of the nuclear posture. Okay, great. Um, let me try to group these together and first. Does anybody have deep thoughts on AI or read Olympia Polico's report, which came out yesterday? I certainly have not. Second, um, on sort of Russia as being sort of offensive in forms and methods of indirect competition, direct warfare, information warfare, and the like, um, while being, as, as you characterize it, uh, Kristen, defensive in, in nuclear weapons, uh, and, and then uh, a series of great questions on how do we interpret the nuclear posture review and all the revelations that sort of change character and tone of how Russian capabilities and Russian intent is described there. Um, and, and so with that, Kristen, first, for you, if you could, any, any thoughts on, on the sort of information political warfare bit, and in particular, which I suspect you do have, on the nuclear posture review? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, so the... So what is the logic of, of uh, Russian inf uh, offensive uh, information operations, for example? I, I think it is um, to, to demonstrate uh, capability and, uh, and resolve uh, in the face of what they perceive as threats to their own sovereignty. I think that that informs both Russian information operations in, uh, across the European continent. I think that in part was what informed uh, Russian decisions to try to influence uh, US elections. Uh, and intend to, well, I think, first of all, an experiment to see what can be done and how much will you be able to do. 
And then secondly, to, to demonstrate that uh, we may not be as potent in conventional military terms, but we, may, but we are potent in a number of other, uh, using a number of other tools that, uh, that should make an impression on you and that should uh, cause uh, some concern with regard to a potential military confrontation. And I think this is informed by a significant perception of the threat posed by the US and the West towards uh, Russia. Uh, then with regard to, uh, should I move on to NPR or do you want to talk about info ops? Yeah. Okay. Up to you. Uh, uh, with regard to the NPR, why, why are they wrong and I'm right? I, th <laughs> I, I, think, that it, I think it's a misperception. I think it, it's, um, it's an idea uh, that has been, that sort of stuck and has been reinforced by in part, this obsession, I think, with uh, non-strategic nuclear capabilities and dual capable uh, capabilities, and uh, sort of a, a reluctance to to have that discourse challenged by, for example, what the Russians themselves say. I mean, there are a number of Russian officials who have explicitly said that no, our strategy is not escalate to de-escalate, but that just doesn't, for some reason, uh, stick. Um, and um, yeah, th th to be honest, I, I, I have not heard any, uh, I, I haven't uh, as of yet heard the convincing uh, argument uh, that this, uh, that substantiates uh, the claims that the NPR uh, contains, even in discussion with uh, well, the very people who, who formulated it, including uh, General Hyten, when, when he explains the, the reasoning behind it, uh, that doesn't convince me. When he points to what his analysts tell him and, and, and the, the content of their analysis, that still does not convince me. Okay. Well, yeah, if you could briefly, have your yeah. thoughts on NPR. Um, I'll do that. Uh, I mean, on artificial intelligence, I haven't read Elena Polikova's report, so I don't know what it says. I, I think we cyber... Um, uh, various technologies, we all get very excited about these things and often we get excited about them before we can parse them and understand how they're used and how they're not used and what it actually means. I think we're all still struggling with a lot of it. So that, that's um, when I do read uh, the Brookings Report, I'll probably read it with that as, uh, as, my, uh, um, as my lens of how, how do you, to what extent are we ascribing competence where there is actually flailing? To what extent are we seeing um, another country as knowing what they're doing when they're testing things out? But I mean, I'm, I'm kind of talking blind here because I haven't read the reports, so I don't know what I'm commenting on. Um, so why is, um, why is Russia offensive in the real world if its nuclear strategy is defensive? I wouldn't say Russia's nuclear strategy is defensive. I would say Russia's nuclear strategy is deterrent. Mm -hmm. And nukes are different from conventional weapons, and you use them differently. And the whole idea is you don't have to use the nuclear weapons because they're deterrents. And you get to use the conventional weapons for various things as long as they don't risk you getting into a nuclear war, which is how you are deterred. So this isn't a... Um, this isn't uh, a challenging question. This, this isn't a contradiction. Um, you know, why is the United States not using its nuclear weapons to bomb everybody uh, when the United States also has a fairly offensive global military strategy? Um, because that would lead to very bad things. Um, and I'm hoping we don't, you know, United States does not shift to such a strategy. Uh, speaking of which, the nuclear posture review, I agree completely with Kristen. I also think it's fascinating that they're saying something is new that was actually introduced, run through the ringer, and then rejected almost two decades ago. Mm -hmm. that, that's what's, oh my god, this is new. You know, it, it was in an article published in 1999, which, you know, tried to make sense of what it was that the Russians were thinking, how the Russians were thinking through these things. It looked like that was what was entered into strategy in 1999, 2000, and then the Russians said, whoa, okay, we're not doing this. Um, is it possible that it's come back? Is it possible that elements of it never went away? You know what, there, that strategy has its proponents in Russia. 
For the last 20 years, every once in a while, somebody writes a piece arguing for exactly that. So yes, of course, there's a community that believes in it. And as I've said before, I think the emphasis on dual capable weapons, which I do think is rooted in their course of capabilities, which I think fits nicely with Kristen's argument that it kind of it gives you that little extra oomph for your conventional bang that, oh, they could, you know, the threat that leaves something to chance. I think that feeds that perception in the United States. Um, and I also think that once you believe that that's Russian strategy, every exercise that includes dual capable systems, you're going to mm -hmm. see as a nuclear, or at least a prospectively nuclear exercise, mm -hmm. which if you're the intelligence community, which is doing worst case scenario analysis, says, oh, well, this could be a nuclear exercise. So we have to look at it as a nuclear exercise. And Iskanders and calibers are everywhere, so that means every Russian exercise, pretty much, is a nuclear exercise. Except I'm pretty sure it's not. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think that the, the whole uh, Western rhetoric regarding Russian nuclear saber rattling as well can be interpreted in this light. Or, I mean, there are a lot of Russian statements about dual capable systems or uh, nuclear capable systems that are. Uh, sort of spun and uh, recited and recycled in, in the Western argumentation about uh, Russian aggressive uh, or offensive nuclear uh, behavior or doctrine. And then when you go back and look at the actual statements, they, they could basically, normally the statements can be interpreted in this way or the other way, but you can, you can choose to interpret them in a certain way and use them to reinforce your pre-existing notion that this in fact is Russian strategy. Um, I'll just say very, very briefly in answer to the NPR question, I, I do sense that in part it is a, a normal con normative conversation explanation to American people of what the United States government has to do to make up for 25 years of divestment and nuclear modernization in response to pure adversary capabilities, and that's part of it, frankly. Another part of it is that 20th century problems are very new to a number of people in the 21st century, and that's very discernible from the policy debate on nuclear weapons. And the third part of it are the three questions I asked Kristen at the very, very beginning about varying interpretations of Russian nuclear strategy or doctrine Right? and perhaps disagreements within the administration. But in any case, the desire and decision of government to try to develop flex flexible options and contingency plans and the ability to deal with a spectrum of possibilities, right, sort of coded into it. And, and you can take that for what it's worth. I think um, I may have time for one more question. The gentleman's been patient right there, but, but it will have to be brief. And so. Uh, I'm Jeff Price with Johns Hopkins Sites. So uh, taken as a given that what the U.S. has said about the Russian SSCA cruise missile, um, what are the implications for Russian strategy? I mean, first, why would they have developed this missile? And second, what are the implications for the intermediate range uh, regime? Okay. So try to go very briefly. Um, yeah. Christian, any thoughts on why and, and implications for INF? Implications for INF, yeah, the, the, um, yeah. Um, I mean, Sorry, I a lot of arguments that. that have been proposed in the in the Russian discourse in the past ten years, eight, seven, eight years, uh, regarding the uh, uh, disproportionate negative uh, repercussions of the INF treaty uh, for Russia. So, I mean, it's possible to, as far as I understand, it's possible to. Uh, think about Russian geography and point to a number of areas where you can say, yes, this could make sense here, here, and here, uh, in both uh, eastern and southern uh, strategic direction, as far as I understand. And, uh, and the notion that, um, that sea and air base capabilities may not be uh, sufficient from the Russian perspective. Um, I think that I'll leave it at that. Well, you want anything to us? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 do, I don't know why the system gets developed. Um, somebody starts to develop it, and it slips under the radar. Yeah. The army doesn't like the idea of relying on the air force and the navy to get things done. Russia doesn't like the idea, you know, like the idea of the, uh, its ground forces not having capabilities. Um, all of that, but you know violates INF, then that's not good for the treaty. Are there ways out of this? Uh, not if the United States withdraws from the treaty. Um, 
Look, I mean, we were at an impasse. It was a difficult conversation, but you could see difficult, complicated, compromise-filled ways out. There are no ways out if the United States withdraws from the treaty. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you for our speakers. It's been a wonderful uh, audience, wonderful conversations. On that point, I'd like to close it out. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs>